So Scylla is a formally verifiable safe contract language and it stands for smart contract intermediate level language. That's the full form of Scylla. This is just an overview on Zilliqa. Essentially, Zilliqa is a high performance blockchain that uses sharding uh, to scale linearly, which means that as the number of nodes in the network increase, the scalability actually increases. Um, and it were, it was a brainchild of many people from NUS and a couple of other academics, uh, entrepreneurs and engineers. And we have over 70 project teams from over 20 countries that are currently building on top of Zilliqa. So this is how the how Zilliqa compares with other other chains. The main criteria to look at is the transaction throughput. And, and our consensus is actually proof of work plus PBFT. This consensus uh, allows us to achieve have instant finality, which means that if, if a transaction is confirmed once on the chain, you don't need to wait for more time. Like for Bitcoin, it's recommended to wait for like three uh, block confirmations before uh, you can accept that, okay, there is no chance of a block uh, getting reversed and your transaction getting rolled up. But in Zilliqa, once a transaction gets added to the chain, it, it's instant finality. An overview on Scylla. Scylla is uh, it's a peer-reviewed and safe by design smart contract language. It uses functional design principles as seen in OCaml, and it allows it to be more friendly towards static checks and formal verification. Also, it is Scylla is non-Turing complete, so there's possibility of for formal methods uh, as well writing formal proofs because of its uh, simplicity and uh, being non-Turing complete. There are People think that there will be many limitations, but you can almost write any smart contract that you see in Solidity currently in Scylla. And uh, yeah, so that's not an, not an, uh, not an issue as you, if you are a developer. So people ask why a new language, uh, what were the problems with Solidity? I'll just share to briefly walk through two examples of Solidity hacks and uh, yeah, why, why we decided to create a, a new language that sort of this, these hacks sort of form an inspiration to create a new language. So underlying causes with Solidity are, uh, it's complex and there's a lot of expected versus unexpected behavior and there's no formal verification in Solidity. And the thing about smart contracts, just FII, is that unlike traditional software, they can't be updated and you have a gas mechanism to pay for computational costs. Like say, if you're building a web 2.0 application, people usually have the mentality to build fast and you know, uh, ship things. If if there's an issue, they just update the software, and that's that's very simple to do. But in smart contracts, you can't do that. That's sort of like the value proposition of smart contracts that it's run in a, a decentralized manner. So you can't update smart contracts once they're deployed. You can make maybe make a new contract deploy it to a new address, and you can say, okay, this one is now the new contract. But you can have some like update upgrade mechanism, but still you can't update the initial contract. And the gas mechanism part of it is that people, developers, they are paying gas for smart contracts. If they write some buggy code and their co contract, you know, keeps on running, there's a chance that their funds might get exhausted. Obviously it's recommended for developers to first test this functionality on testnet so that they don't encounter such issues when they are deploying on mainnet. But still, that's that's also one consideration. Smart contract holds millions of dollars, and they are running a biz, in a Byzantine environment, and it's like having a bounty on them. So or every smart contract has a bounty. If you can hack that contract and potentially gain access to the funds, you basically earn that bounty. So coming back to the DAO incident led to the fork in Ethereum and created Ethereum and Ethereum Classic two chains. And uh, it's still quite controversial and uh, many people don't think that this should have happened. And it was still early days in Ethereum and overall ecosystem has definitely evolved after the hack, but still smart contracts ha ha hacks are still popular. Uh, essentially the DAO was that people, it, DAO stands for decent, decentralized autonomous organization. People had the option to deposit funds to the DAO and they'll make sort of like investments in a decentralized manner. It will be all community driven. And after making investments, they can earn some reward. If people invested in some token projects through the DAO and the valuation of those token projects increased compared to ETH, they'll be able to withdraw, withdraw more ETH. It had this withdraw function, uh, the DAO contract, and it essentially allowed people to withdraw their funds. 
Now, the issue with this function was like, if, if you look at this function on the left side, you see function reclaim. Essentially, what it does is it checks the uh, value. If person calls this, essentially message.sender is the address that is calling it. So what it does, it, it does message.sender.call.value if you look at this line. And this transfers control to this contract. So if, if, if the person calling this contract, if calling the withdraw function was a normal user, there was no logic that would do anything when the control of this contract is passed here. But if this contract was a smart contract, when this line of code is executed, the control actually passes to this contract and it can do some malicious things then. And what it can do is, for example, it can just keep on calling this withdraw function again and again and try to deplete the funds uh, in, in the DAO contract. And that's what essentially happened. The hacker called this and it, he was able to call it again and again. And this method, when the value uh, of, of the shares of the hacker um, in, in the DAO contract, never went to zero. So he called it, he withdrew his funds, called it again, he withdrew, withdrew his funds and so on and so on. And the right way they should have written the contract would be, first they should have stored the value that needed to be transferred to the hacker in a variable, like here we use uh, in the variable amount, if you see on the right side, and then set the value of funds of the hacker in the contract to be equal to zero, and then essentially transfer the amount to the hacker or to the person, whatever. This didn't happen. and essentially the hacker was able to drain funds. This, this led to be almost, I think $50 million worth of ETH was stolen, which at in today's times would be quite, quite higher, maybe 10 X or something like that, because the value of ETH was very less back then. So yeah, it was, it was a very large hack. Now, uh, what, how do we mitigate this issue in Scylla, right? That's, that's what we started to discuss about in Scylla, all the external calls to contracts or or any other address happen at the end if say you are writing a function in Scylla, we call that a transition the, all the external calls happen in such a way that in a transition first you have the logic and then you use the send keyword that's what we use to actually do external calls so this uh, DAO hack would actually ha have been prevented in Scylla at the language level itself as you can see on the right side we have the code snippet of Scylla Similarly, uh, talking about the parity multisig hack in the parity multisig hack, essentially a noob was able to set himself as the owner and he, he accidentally deleted the contract. So because the owner had the option to kill the contract and around $150 million worth of ether were locked uh, because of this error. In this scenario, we, ha we had this init owner function and people were able to call the init owner function and pass in this pa pass an address. If you look at the owner. In, in line number two, address owner. And if you look at line number three, which is the buggy line, the value of the this owner gets changed if, if someone calls init owner. So that's, that's what happened. And the noob was able to set a new owner, uh, himself as the owner, and he accidentally deleted that. So in Scylla, there's actually a clean separation between libraries and a non-library contract. And also we have mutable and immutable variables. Like if people want to if, if people if you want to have some variables that you don't need to be changed like an owner of a contract is something you don't want to change right after after the contract is deployed so so you can set immutable variables Th those immutable variables actually get set when the contract is getting deployed and mutable variables can be changed after the contract is deployed as well so in Scylla we would have used the owner variable and the it, this would not have ha happened because no word no one would have been able to change the owner. And uh, so these are some Scylla design principles. The separation between computation and communication. Every contract computation is implemented at a standalone atomic transition. And there's no involvement of third parties uh, in, involving any other party. So say you have one uh, logic, like say this, I'll, I'll explain this after when we are looking at the contract code, um, I'll explain all these properties, but the third one is something which we talked about earlier with the DAO hack, which is that the separation between invocation and chained contract calls. Yeah. Because every, every external function, uh, every external call happens at the end of the function or transition as we call in Scylla. So why are Scylla contracts safe to write? Um, you can read these points. Basically Scylla is peer reviewed. Um, it identifies uh, security risks. It is easier to write. 
safe contracts and you can mathematically verify the security of your contracts using uh, formal verification and yeah these these are some security features of scylla so scylla automatically handles arithmetic underflows and overflows and since it's for functional programming language the the structured recursion instead of loops which also makes formal verification easier and your code looks more readable